pleasure for me to have uh, with me today William Bond. William Bond is a emeritus professor at the University of Cape Town and is also a scientist at Scion, which is a long-term ecological research center. So William, talking about uh, changes in vegetation over time, you know, as a paleontologist, I've always been intrigued by these big changes that have happened after major extinction events. But grasses really take off much later. Do you have any idea what spurred the spread of grasses, uh, grasslands, much later? Mm. Well, I think it's one of the, the, the most intriguing uh, Earth's history mysteries. Both, actually, both the spread of flowering plants, which is not, uh, the reasons are not uh, obvious. And then the, uh, the second great angiosperm revolution. Well, there was another one uh, as well, which is the spread of forests. The forests were also intriguing. And then these grasses, the most unlikely, improbable growth form. Mm. A little plant, herbaceous plant, yeah. you know, half a meter to a meter tall, that uh, began to take over the world. So it's, uh, it was such an anomaly that for many years people thought that uh, we saw grasslands, especially in the tropics, yeah. they were the consequence of human deforestation, people chopping trees yes. down. And we know that that's now not true. They, they've been there for millions of years. Um, although it's still a popular public belief that uh, these grasslands are secondary. They're not. They're ancient. So the big mystery is why did they take off? They, they were lurking around in the landscape. They were sitting, we think, in little uh, edaphic soil ghettos mm. where forest trees couldn't grow and shade them out. And they hung in there by the fingernails until uh, around 8 million years ago uh, something changed and they just took off and today they cover about a fifth of the world. Um, so a, re a remarkable change in, in global vegetation. Mm. So what could that something be? Um, well, I think the, uh, the important thing to, to say is that it's not climate, okay. because huge areas of grasslands and savannas have forests within them. You can find on a hill there's a forest and right next door is savanna. Mm. So they're occurring under the same climate. Mm. And uh, vast areas of savannas could be completely different, there could be forest. Really? So this is unusual because uh, for many years biogeographers have assumed that the major vegetation of the world is controlled by climate. Mm. Savannas, no. Um, so you needed something to, to drive the forest back. Um, and the, the first really coherent idea was that there was a drop in CO2, atmospheric CO2, and um, that this favored a new form of grass they, we call them C4 grasses, okay. and their unique invention was to um, concentrate carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so that from the photosynthetic machinery's point of view they were always operating at high CO2. Hmm. And this brought a whole lot of advantages and disadvantages. It meant that um, the photosynthetic enzymes, uh, which is the nitrogen that animals require, yeah. could be produced in much lower quantities. So from the animal's point of view, you had a lot of carbon and hardly any protein, mm -hmm. and that reduced the quality. From fire perspective, this is the most wonderful fuel mm -hmm. because uh, the animals don't, don't remove it, yeah. it's inedible, um, and it's perfect uh, fuel. So what we, what we think is that um, in large areas of the world, fires mm -hmm. began to burn much more prominently and helped to promote the, uh, the, the spread of savannas rolling back the forest trees. Mm. And then the, the trouble with low CO2 is that um, trees are intrinsically carbon demanding. They have carbon rich skeletons. Yes. So to build a tree you need a lot of CO2. And when CO2 plummeted, um, our work, we did experimental studies on trees and their response to CO2. Yeah. They are hopeless at dealing with low CO2. Mm. They can't handle drought, they can't handle browsing, they can't handle fire. Um, so the low CO2 provided the context, the necessary environment uh, to weaken trees. But you needed that extra, something extra to knock back the trees. And we think that was fire and possibly herbivores. Uh -huh. And that brings me to your latest publication showing that the, in the African savanna, there was actually a, a big role that Balmans played in um, bringing grasslands to, Afri to Africa and kind of cutting back on the forests. So that was very, very interesting. 
Yeah, no, we were, I'm very pleased with that paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should be. It, uh, we struggled to, to put the animals into the picture. Uh, you don't get um, satellite maps of mammals. You know, what were dinosaurs up to in the Cretaceous? Yeah. Plunking around and smashing trees. Just walking down for a drink, they must have been smashing trees over. Yeah. Uh, how does one reconstruct that? Um, so we, uh, we, we, we did an analysis of uh, plants that are restricted, trees that are restricted to fire-dependent savannas, um, to try and date the origin of savannas through dating the trees that grow within them. And these were high rainfall fire-dependent savannas. But we knew that fire doesn't burn everywhere, and in the dry areas of Africa are still savannas, but mm -hmm. fires are much less common. Okay. And these are the, the centers of mammal abundance and diversity, the Serengeti, Kruger National Park and so on. So we try to find an indicator of uh, mammal dominated savannas. And the big indicator, if you know anything about Africa, are prickly plants. Mm. If you walk around our, our big mammal reserves, they're full of prickly plants. Exactly. So we took a sample of 2,000 uh, tree species from Africa, worked out how many were, were prickly, and we were able to reconstruct, uh, for each tree, we could um, look at the environmental context mm -hmm. and where they grew and uh, see whether spiny plants are indeed markers of savannas and also markers of high animal density. Mm -hmm. um, that was a heroic effort, but nowadays <laughs> people can do these things much more quickly. And we were helped by a, a wonderful uh, piece of work by Gareth Hempson where he reconstructed the mammal diversity and abundance in Africa as it would have been a thousand years ago, okay. looking at data from game parks and national parks, and it created a surface of mammal abundance and diversity. So we could then link where are the prickly plants and which mammals are feeding on them. Yes. And that pointed clearly to the bovids, and it pointed clearly to mixed feeders of medium size, mm -hmm. social, social uh, mixed feeders like gazelles, uh, and impala, and also large browsers, things like kudu. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of the goats and the deer of other parts of the world. Um, so now we knew we, that, that uh, prickly plants were associated with grass, savannas, mm -hmm. uh, drier savannas on fertile soils. Uh, these were the epicenters of mammal abundance in Africa, um, and we knew which mammals. So now we went back in time using molecular phylogenies. Yes. And to our astonishment, we found that um, spiny plants were not an ancient feature of Africa. They, they're actually new, new in a, in a geological sense, that for tens of millions of years, Africa was full of um, proboscideans, elephants and their yes. relatives, and uh, hierocoids, the, of which there are only a handful of little creatures yes. left. Uh, but they were much bigger. They were the size of small rhinos, some of them, in the past. And under, with those browsers around, Africa had no spiny plants. Mm -hmm. And then spiny plants just, bam, the act of creation, and they just appeared in Africa and took off um, around 15, 16 million years ago, according to our mm -hmm. molecules. So then we looked at which animal groups, okay. if any, coincided with the appearance of those spiny plants. And there were the bovids. And uh, using the same approach with the bovids, there was this absolutely remarkable eruption of spiny plants mm -hmm. and a simultaneous eruption of bovids. Where the bovids come from, well, Africa had collided uh, with Eurasia. Uh, and when the two continents met each other, the, you began to get an exchange of Eurasian animals into Africa. And the elephants of Africa spread to the rest of the world, the mammoths and mastodons and so on. Okay. But the legacy of those, uh, of those mammals, we argue, is intense. When the bovids arrived, there was intense herbivory on the seedlings and saplings of forest trees. Mm -hmm. And this helped to open up the forests, providing opportunities for the, for the grasses. Grasses to take over. Wow. That's right. That's fantastic. What a wonderful story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's an extraordinary thing. And of course, now we, we'd love to know what is happening in other parts of the world. Um, there were similar prickly uh, forms of savanna in South America, uh, in North America, in, in Asia, 
but they had older or even younger mm -hmm. um, browsers. So we can test the argument by looking but at the world, you know. Exactly, and looking at their fossil record and looking at the evolution of the uh, mammal, mammalian fauna as well. That, that's right. Oh, yeah. It sounds fantastic. And it will almost well, certainly be proved <laughs> not completely right. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it. I think that's the nature of science. Is, that's you know, the nature of science. A, we have a good hypothesis and we try to find the evidence to support it and if it doesn't, well, then we find another hypothesis. Absolutely. So, William, given the um, high carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere currently, what do you think are the implications for the future? Well, I like to walk around with a big placard saying the end of savannas. <laughs> oh, goodness, really? <laughs> the end of the world. Uh, I think um, we are really threatened with a major loss of, of one of the world's great biomes. Mm which contains, and it's not only high CO2, it's uh, the loss of the mammals that help to maintain these things as open, and it's suppression of fires uh, through roads and buildings mm -hmm. and legislation. I think savannas have their backs to the wall, actually, and, uh, and that's where the models are, are, are projecting it. The future of Africa and African savannas looks pretty bleak. Really? Hmm. With all kinds of repercussions that we need to think about. So, William, thank you so much for coming and sharing your research ideas with us, and we look forward to hearing more from, from your research group. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. I, I'm an enthusiast, as you can see, and I reckon this is the most intriguing question that anyone could ask of Earth history. Thanks.